Thank you. Hello, sound. Yes. Can I get some? Yes. I spent the whole morning making this. So, because uh, usually I fix the slides a little bit before I do a presentation, but uh, I thought I could do this uh, very quickly, and uh, I just spent the morning doing it. And I'm very proud of it. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I actually couldn't get it better than this because when you because this is HTML, and when I go very high resolution, Chrome just crashes. So, uh, so yeah, this is I don't know 640, 480 or something like that. But it doesn't matter. So, uh, so yeah. Um, so yeah. Welcome. My name is Mahmoud Abdel Ghani, uh, and I had a side project about porting Doom 3 to uh, Java, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, everybody starts with an intro, so why not? Uh, my intro is a bit different because I'm not talking about myself because I don't think I'm interesting enough. Um, but yeah, I saw two people who didn't play Doom. Uh, I'm interested why you're here, actually, if you don't know anything about Doom, but uh, you're welcome nonetheless. Um, so this is, a, this is a quick recap, right? Because uh, so it's Software is the company who created the actual Doom. They did a lot of interesting stuff, all those cool games. OK, Rage isn't on there, but Rage should also be on there. Uh, but the, the, cool, the coolest, I think I'm keep switching. I did something. I did something. Yeah. Yeah, it's my fault. I'm going to do this. Um, so the, the most inter interesting thing they did is they open source all their games, which is very unusual in the world, right? Because AAA games don't usually get open source, which is cool. People hack their games. People modded their games, people such as me, right? Um, and here, here's an interesting story, the Nerd Rage anecdote, which uh, has nothing to do uh, with me, actually, about me. Uh, I'm not involved in the story at all. But back when they open sourced the original Doom uh, in 95, 96, something like that, uh, people were mean on the internet like they are today. And they started looking through the source code, and they came across this piece of code. Um, this is a very interesting book, by the way. Everybody should read it, buy it. It's available free on the internet. It's an amazing book. Uh, and this page is from that book, right? Uh, and people came across this piece of code, especially, uh, specifically this uh, for loop, or uh, while loop. Um, and this is used every time you try to load an asset in the game, right? So an asset is basically like a picture or sound, anything that is in the game that isn't source code, which is usually packed in a big file, and you have a name of something, and then you look it up. And people came across this, and this is basically just a sequential lookup. So every time you load a picture or load something, you go through the whole file and look for it. And of course, people in, in the 90s were as nerdy as we are today, and they thought, no, this is a stupid idea. Uh, every CS101 student knows. You just load this once and load it in a hash table and just do a lookup. It's much faster. And they started going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But the Doom guys themselves, they, they kept insisting, no, we actually we know what we're doing. We tested this. This is the most efficient way to do this. So years later, some of the people that were in this original discussion, they, you know, they rediscussed this whole situation. And actually, the Doom guys were right. Um, so you have to think about it like this, right? So loading a level, for example, in a game, it's not just loading the assets. You have to do some, you have to load the actual asset. This is only the lookup of where it is in the file. You still have to load it, right? You have to decompress stuff. You have to like uh, de decode stuff and that kind of stuff. So if a level load takes like 10 seconds, fixing this small bit would make it take like 9.9 .9 seconds. So who cares really, right? And again, this is, this is in 93 or 92 when the original Doom came out. Memory wasn't as cheap as it was back then as it is right now. Not sure I'm saying that correctly, but memory wasn't cheap, right? So if you load everything, all the assets you have, at the beginning of the program or at the beginning of the game, right? And you have them, keep them in memory for the whole game, the whole run of the game. That's like well, a couple of kilobytes of, of, of RAM, which isn't cheap, right? It's not, yeah, I know it's, it's, it's almost nothing, especially nowadays, but back then it wasn't, right? So yes, this is an interesting story I like to tell because it kind of gives you a feel about this, that this is kind of different, right? So yeah, Joom is the name of my project. It's fun, that's it. I don't remember why I started it, but it's just fun. Um, so, so why the intro, right? Um, so during this project and some other projects I, I did, right, it was really becoming very obvious that game development wasn't as glamorous as people thought it was, right? There's a very ugly side to it. 
Um, and a lot of it hinges on um, programming languages, right? So most game developers actually hate C++, but there isn't something better than C++, so that's why they use C++, but they absolutely hate it, right? Um, and yeah, when I started doing this in Java, I started hating parts of Java as well, right? And, and it, it just is, right? Because some stuff just makes your life fucking hell. Um, so yeah, that's the, I think that's the reason for the intro, or just to waste, I don't know, like five minutes and four seconds, right? And this table, because every good presentation has like tables and graphs and such, and should I be standing here or something? Or, yeah. This is just the evolution of the engine through time, right? So of, the, of, the, of their engines, right? So the first one, 92, which was the one with the big problem, was 40,000 lines of code. And the last one, it Tech 4, that's the one I worked on, 600,000 lines of code, which is, uh, means absolutely nothing, actually. It's just interesting, right? Right. So yeah, uh, disclaimer, of course. So I'm not really an expert on anything. Uh, I'm not a professional game developer, I'm not a professional JVM writer, I'm not a professional C++ developer either. Um, I just spent a lot of time doing this and it was interesting and I just want to share some of my opinions with you people. And uh, I don't know, people keep inviting me back at conferences, which is very strange, I must say. But uh, here I am, here I am. You know, everybody sees Doom in the title, thinks it's cool, but it's not, right? So, yeah. so um, the first part of the presentation is a bit like uh, comparing Java and C++, right? So, and some stuff that's really cool in C++ and is very difficult to do in Java, right? And Bjarne, for the people who don't know him, he's like the James Gosling of C++. But yeah, he's slightly more, uh, I don't know, I want to say meaner, but he's not per se meaner, he's just more, I don't know, James Gosling is like the nicest guy you can ever meet, so it's just difficult to compare anybody to him. But but that's just beyond it, right? So, um, yeah, because I did that Doom Fire thing, which I will show again, this thing, right? I didn't have time to change this picture, which I always change, because there's so many beautiful pictures of people doing this magnificent type of shit. And I always change the picture, because I can. But yeah, so the first uh, thing I always talk about is, is uh, overloading, right? Uh, operator overloading, which is the thing I think I missed the most uh, dur during this whole project, right? Um, An operator overloading for people who've only done Java uh, is, is basically in um, other programming languages like C++. Uh, when you define an object, you can also define methods, but you can also say, okay, so if I use the plus operator with this object with another object of the same type, then you should do this operation. Like, for example, add the members, if it's a matrix, for example, or a vector or whatever, right? And it makes it look, I don't know, normal instead of what we do. This snippet is from a beautiful paper that uh, Guy Steele wrote years and years ago. And then they kidnapped him or killed him. And they never, uh, this never came to fruition. But he was, you know, he was one of the proponents uh, of, of operator overloading. But we never got it. And I don't know if we will ever get it. Uh, this is a simple example from C++. And yeah, C out is the system print line of C++. And uh, this is, is often uh, quoted as the reason we do not have operator overloading in Java. So if you see, we use the, like, the left chip operators. And this is basically you're like, doing concatenation, actually. That's the only thing you're doing. And people didn't like that. Like You're misusing a mathematical operator or a bit logic operator for something very strange. And this is, this is one in the standard uh, API of C++. People didn't like that. So I'm not sure if that story is true, but every time I talk about operator overloading, somebody tells me that, so it might be true. So this is an example of a line of code from the game. Uh, this is C++, looks normal, doesn't matter what it does. So this is my Java version of the same thing, right? And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so how else would you do it, <laughs> right? So these are matrices and vectors, right? These are objects. How else would you do it? I mean, the guys from Java, the, the Java guys themselves, when they introduced Big Decimal and Big, uh, what's the other one? Big Decimal and its little sister, right? They also did something like this. They added like a function to do add and multiplication and whatever and such. And it's ugly as hell, uh, but it kind of works, right? And this single line of code, which is the same as the line of code above it, uh, it, had, it had a bug, right? And this is also to like, to like two for one to show you right away what my bug was. And my bug was simply enough that red bracket, I'm not sure if you can see it, but 
Do I have? Uh, yeah, whatever. You can see it. You can see it. Uh, so that red bracket, right? It was just in the wrong place. And it was still working in like 80% of the cases, but in other cases it wasn't working. And then debugging, debugging, debugging. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So it's difficult. It's shitty. It's, it's hell, right? And, uh, yeah. Another example. Uh, this is a more simplified example, actually. So this is a simple operation. You have three matrices. You want to like A plus B times C, right? How would you do that in Java in this, with the same way I just showed you, right? Somebody's laughing. He knows exactly what I'm going to say. So this is my first, this is what my instinct tells me to do, right? This is absolutely wrong, right? Because mathematically speaking, when you have precedence, right, a multiplication comes before an addition. So your code becomes something like this which doesn't read anymore the same way, or the, the, it doesn't read as easily as it reads as the one above, right? So operator overloading, very difficult uh, to get right. Uh, and uh, yeah, I really miss it, right? Strange operator, right? Uh, the other one, uh, no, the other one, the second one, um, unsigned primitives, um, which is also something very strange to talk about. Um, because people don't usually know that they are missing unsigned primitives. And I was one of those people, right? And an unsigned primitive is basically a primitive, but it only has a positive range. It doesn't have a negative range. So if you go to the max and you do plus one, then you return to zero or one, right? Why is that useful? Well, think about it. I mean, here, for example, you give a size of an array, which is an integer, right? So min minus one. That's a valid size. This will compile. This will, will absolutely compile. It will not work, of course, but it will compile, right? So why is that not strange? Why doesn't anybody think that it's strange, right? This is just an example, of course. It's just, it's just for fun, because why not, right? It's the end of the day, and, and a new date uh, minus one. This one will actually compile, and it will work. So uh, try it when you get home. It will absolutely work. And it, with the, the further you go with the, like, like the negative range, you will get like strange, strange results. But it does work, right? Um, so yes, so my simple solution was, so I needed this sometimes because I just need a very l large positive number, right? So yeah, the simple solution is, okay, then go to the next positive number, the next primitive type. So if I need an unsigned integer, then I go to an long, and I only use like the positive range, right? From short, I go to int. From byte, I go to short. From long, I go home, right? You can go anywhere there. Um, yeah, there was, was a funny joke somebody put on the internet, and I just loved it, so I had to put it here. I just had to, right? It was just fabulous. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so, uh, sorry. Um, I also did a simple benchmark, uh, which uh, I'm not a big fan of benchmarks, because, you know, and the reason I'm not a big fan of benchmarks is also the reason I can show you this. Because these benchmarks don't mean anything, right? So I did this experiment a couple of times, and I wrote the worst times I could find. So sometimes I got better results than this. But I won't write those, because that doesn't prove my point. My, this proves my point, so I picked the, the worst results, right? Um, but, but, but the simplicity of it, right? From, from in to long, for example, or from float to double, right? Or from in to integer, right? With the boxing and the unboxing. The memory usages and, and the time, right? It's the, it's not as cheap as you might think, right? And I did this, and I don't remember why, actually, I did this benchmark. But uh, yeah, I've been, I've been working on this project for four years, so I don't remember a lot of stuff. Uh, and I think, I think it's just my personality, so it uh, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, right? So immutability is awesome, right? Uh, C++ has this weird concept of immutability, right? And uh, this is usually part. I never actually ask if there are any C++ programmers in the room, but Yes, thank you. So, <laughs> but I can usually see it. So when I start talking about this stuff, and somebody looks at me very strange, I know he's a C++ developer, um, because C++ has like a lot of concepts. But because C++ is so low level, so any concept that exists in the language you can work around. In Java, you can't do that. Um, but assuming you don't know how to work around this stuff, this is awesome, right? So when you define something as a const in C++. So const itvec3, for example, the blue one, it's a different type now. It's become now a different type than itvec3. So you cannot pass something that is mutable anymore to this function. It has to be immutable per definition, right? And uh, yes, I know what you're going to say. Don't say it, please, right? 
So that's a very powerful, uh, to me at least, it's a very powerful concept, right? So you, you force somebody to, to give something read-only to, to a method, right? That's, that's just awesome. The other one, I really love that one as well. This here, you define the method itself as read-only. This method is not allowed to change anything uh, from the body it's, it's being called, from, from the objects being called from anymore, right? If you try that, it will not compile, right? This is awesome. This is just beautiful. And we don't have anything comparable to these two, at least. Uh, in, in, in Java, right? We have final, which is... Uh, till this day, I don't actually know why somebody invented final. I mean, it makes sense for when you do inheritance and stuff. That's really the only place it makes sense. The other ones don't really make sense. Okay, if you work with primitives, maybe it makes sense. So yeah, I'm going to ignore the orange one because I'm already late. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this one. Yeah, sorry, it's just... Uh, uh, yeah, I want to skip this one, but it took like took me like 15 minutes to make this picture a couple of months ago. So, uh, so <laughs> enums. <laughs> so this is C++ enum, you know, or the C enum, right? Uh, the only thing you can do with an enum in C++ or C other languages, right? Is you can just give the number, right? An enum is actually basically just a fancy uh, int. You can also interchange it with ints, actually. That's the only thing you can do with it. And that's the only thing we cannot do with it in Java, right? And here I tried to write like one of those cool enums that do everything. And, uh, and I don't know, right? So, so I, I see a lot of these types of enums at work. And I want to cry because when you do this, then you have to test your enum. And when you test your enum, I become sad, right? Because really, who writes a unit test for an enum, right? <laughs> but, uh, but OK. But if it's like this, then yeah, sure, right? But still, again, you, can, you cannot do this, right? You cannot have duplicate values. You cannot have values, actually. Enum doesn't have a value anymore. And yeah, it's just strange. So I'm going to skip, yeah, weird stuff. Skip that. Uh, skip this one as well. Uh, pointers. I love pointers. Yeah, I'm going to talk about pointers. Um, so this is, um, I, I make this joke a lot because I went to school in Holland, right? And, uh, and when I went to school there, a lot of people were leaving uh, like uh, programming. Uh, you have like the more technical side of computer science, and then you have the, like the other stuff, the business, whatever. And people were leaving programming behind because they couldn't handle pointers, which I found very strange, right? But, uh, but yeah, they are uh, interesting. So I assume everybody knows pointers because no. Um, so the idea behind the pointer it's difficult to explain, uh, but it's just because, you know, in C++, uh, stuff doesn't move around in memory unless you move it. So you can have a memory address, and if you leave something there, after two days, it will still be there. That's the idea behind pointers, right? Um, how is that helpful, right? So if you have something, you can give, uh, you can point to it, to its memory address, and use that memory address, pass that memory address around. It's similar to a reference, but not really. Right? Uh, and this is a simple example, right? Uh, this example is what do you do if you, have, if you want to have multiple returns, return values, right? And the obvious answer is always create a wrapper object. But I hate that answer. It's ugly and it's unnecessary and whatever, right? Some prog program languages have multiple return statements, uh, whatever it's called. Some have tuples and that kind of stuff. And uh, C++, the newer C++ also has something different, but this is a simple solution. Just, you know, give it like two pointers and reassign the pointers in the, in the, in the, in the function itself, right? So yeah, my, my simple solution for this in Java is, uh, is just, you know, create one element arrays. I have like hundreds and thousands of one element arrays in, uh, in the code. And this is an int, so it doesn't matter much, but if it's an actual object, right, then the only thing you have to add is like the bracket zero bracket, right, and then dots, and then you have all the stuff from your object. Instead, if you have a wrapper, then you do like a dot get something, dot blah, 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 blah. I like this more. Uh, last time I gave this talk, somebody uh, pointed out to me, a C++ developer, he said, actually, this looks like C++, because in C++, arrays and pointers are interchangeable. And he was absolutely right. So this syntax also works for C++, which doesn't matter. I know, I know. But I just uh, wanted to thank the gentleman. Uh, I don't remember his name. French gentleman uh, with red shirt. Yes? Excellent. So, so this, is, this is a use case, right? Another is uh, with pointers, right? Because you point to a location in memory, right? 
you can just cast that location in memory to anything else. So in this example, I'm pointing to an id matrix 3. I know that's like nine floats, uh, so it's like nine times four, right? 36 bytes. And I can say, no, no, no. Instead of this being a 36 byte something, I want it to be a four byte something, right? Which is a float pointer. And then I know, OK, so after that, I, have, I can just do go to the next one, next one, and next one, and get all the floats, all the other floats, right? Simple. It's, it's, it seems very simple, right? But the simplest way I could do this in Java was, was this, the, the one at the, at the bottom, right? To just create a new array with floats, uh, which makes it, per definition, a read-only array, right? Uh, in C++, you return everything. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my, uh, my journey. Oh, yeah. And uh, of course, adding insult to injury, you get no pointer exceptions. So that's like, to me at least, right? Slap in the face. I mean, none of the benefits of pointers, only the bad stuff about pointers. But OK. So uh, yeah, I don't know. There is, there is a reason for this. I don't know what it is, but there is a reason. So if somebody knows why it's called a no pointer exception, please tell me, please. Right. Excellent. Not on time, but excellent. So this is the other way around, right? Uh, so this is stuff that was very shitty in C++. And we don't have it in Java. And I think it's kind of cool that we don't have it in Java. I want to say it's, yeah, thank God we don't have it in Java, right? Um, does anybody know the answer to this one? I usually give out a free bottle of water, but they didn't give me water. So you don't get a free bottle of water. But if you don't, do know the answer to this one, then uh, cool. You're awesome. All right. So uh, this is something, a concept, a very strange concept. It's called a macro. Um, uh, I'm not really sure, entirely sure how macros in Excel work, so I'm not sure if this is comparable with Excel. But in C++, a macro is just a piece of text that you define, and it gets searched and replaced in your code before you compile it. And that piece of text, I see a lot of people laughing, so I don't know. Maybe I'm funny, or maybe they know what this is. Let's hope I'm funny. So uh, a macro uh, can be anything, right? It, it can look like anything. It can be it's just text, right? So this macro looks like a method. It's not a method. It looks like a method, right? So let's say access five, right? What will the answer be? And I'm not really looking for answers. It's more like a rhetorical question, right? It's like, so this will be the answer. This will be five times six, which isn't the square of anything, right? Or maybe it is. I don't know. But, but it probably isn't the square of anything, right? Uh, this, is, this is a Stack Overflow example. What's, what's, what's wrong with, with, uh, with the macros? Right? This is the first answer they give you. OK, so this. Excellent, right? Uh, yeah, I stole this from a, an article called Death by Macros because I like the title so much. I used it for the slide and I thought, OK. So this is a piece of code. All the things that are highlighted are macros. I don't know. Somebody thought if should be a macro, which is awesome, right? Uh, and by the way, macros, so here you can kind of see they're, they're all in uppercase. But that's actually a convention. It's not forced at all, right? So they have like a lot of lists on the internet of how uh, the worst macros you can write. And so the, one of my favorites is like define if while, right? And that will search and replace all the if statements in your code with a while. So if this statement is true, it will run forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, which is awesome, right? So this is the basic idea behind a macro for me, right? And as you can see, I'm way too cheap to buy the picture. And I couldn't hack the website, so I just left the Thank you. I'm not sure who's laughing, but thank you. So, uh, so yeah, it, it looks like something, but it's not. But it's not that, right? It looks like a method, but it's not a method. It looks like constant, it's not a, con a constant, right? It can look like anything, and that's it. Uh, so this is an example of a macro. Do I have? A, let's see. Yes. So if you look here to the unroll four, right, which is the same macro. So here you use the same macro in two different methods with very different types, right? The macro doesn't care, as long as it compiles, right? I remember in the old days, uh, when I used to do C++, and IDs weren't very good, right? Uh, you could have like macros in your code, and your code could be like 10 lines long, but then you will get a compilation error in line 300, and you only have like 10 lines. So go debug that. But nowadays, it's much better, of course, so yeah. Uh, and this was a macro. I actually had a very uh, strange bug in this macro. Um, this is a very simple macro to convert degrees to radians and radians to degrees. Very simple. 
Um, but when I converted to Java, we don't have Macros, of course. What, so what did I do? I thought, OK, I'm going to make a method, because it looks like a method. It should act like a method, right? So how do I make a, method, a generic method? I thought to myself, I'm very smart. I'm going to make it a double method, right? So, so double accepts anything. Double is the biggest thing. It swallows up everything. And I did that. And then I had a bug, because doubles were being you know, I expect actually a float. I give it a float, then it converts it to a double, which isn't exact anymore, and then it does some operation, and then it returns the float back, right? So it rounds it up. And it was giving me very, very strange results. So yeah, macros for the win. Uh, yeah, this one is actually for fun. I didn't really have much problems with this. But if you don't know what Hungarian notation is, go read up about it. It's just awesome stuff, right? It's like, yeah, I don't know. It's awesome. This document, how to write unmaintainable code, Everybody should read this uh, document. It's just awesome, right? It's, it's really awesome. Right? Um, so I'm not going to talk about this too much. Um, this one is my favorite, of course, right? So uh, because, you know, hating on Hungarian notation without ha hating on uh, camel, co uh, camel case, right? Uh, so yeah, it's just. This, is, this was an actual class, but people removed it because, I don't know, they thought the title was too short or something, right? So uh, I love this. Anyways. Uh, unions, um, also something very foreign concept. I'm seeing very, yeah. Um, so in the olden days, in C, uh, somebody invented something called a union, which was basically like, uh, you could think about it as a class, but instead of having like multiple members, all the members overlap in memory, right? So it's as wide as they're the widest member, and all the other members, they just overlap with that part of the memory with, uh, from that uh, member. So here, for example, the, the biggest one is IP, which is four bytes, right? OK, they're, they're both the same size, actually. But then you have the, ch the char A, B, C, D, right? And they overlap with the f first byte, second byte, third byte. Yeah, and C, uh, a char is a byte, because it should be a byte, actually, right? Um, and that's, that's the idea, right? And then you do the thing at the bottom there. OK, you assign this to the IP. And then you can do, OK, IP.IP2.A, for example, and you get the first two letters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the common example given on the internet of how unions uh, should be used. It's also the, the most common way people use them. Uh, this is the actual way, I think, uh, I've read at least, that they should be used. I'm not going to explain this because it's way too long, but it's basically some kind of uh, inheritance polymorphism, right? Because in C, you didn't have classes, so you didn't have inheritance, so this is where you did that. And the one on the left is basically the abstract class. The ones on the right, those are like, you know, they extend that abstract class. And based on the type, which every class has as the, at, uh, as the first uh, member, you know which type of uh, class that is. Doesn't matter, just like a crash course on the useless stuff. It took me like 10 minutes to make this picture as well, right? Um, this was a union in the game. Uh, they don't have a lot of unions actually, but this was one in the game. And it really gave me hell, so it took me like a couple of weeks, or maybe a couple of months even to, uh, to convert to Java, successfully converted to Java actually. That's a, way, that's a better way to put it. Because I converted a couple of times and it works, and then after a couple of days I discovered, no, actually it doesn't work at all, right? It's just an illusion. Um, and particularly this one with the big arrow, so, right? So this union had like a pointer to a type of the same union, which was like inception kind of shit, right? So this really gave me hell. Um, it kind of works now. I know this thing has a bug, but I don't care because I have more important stuff to do right now. Uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna pick, the, pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, Rob Pike, nice guy, he sells cool stuff, yeah. Um, yeah, this is some stuff in between, I don't know, it's not cool, it's not bad, maybe if you have it, maybe it's gonna be cool. Five minute picture or whatever, right? So this was also a concept in the other programming languages that don't manage memory for you. Uh, which is destructor, right? The same way you construct an object, you should also destruct it, right? And we kind of do that already. We had finalize, which is, it's deprecated, which means you can still use it, right? Uh, and uh, we have, uh, <laughs> I've never actually met anybody who used it. I've never actually met anybody who knows what it does, right? And uh, yeah, but, but okay. We have auto closable, which is awesome. Uh, only it's, it's the kind of difficult to use. That's, that's a problem because, yeah, yeah it's difficult. Um, and yeah, so, so, the, so, so the reason, I don't really particularly think they're good destructors, right? But um, the reason 
they gave me hell at least was uh, because destructors, you have, to, you have to call them, right, in C++. You just have to call them. If you don't call them, you get a memory leak. If you get a memory leak, then, you know, you have, life goes to uh, shit, right? So since you have to call the structure and you have to call it when you no longer need the object, that's per definition, right, you can do stuff in there. And this is, for, this is a very simple thing. All this stuff happened in the uh, destructor. Um, oh, let me see, let me see, let me see. This one, for example, stop sound, right? So I wasn't doing this. So people were dying in the game and they were still making sounds, right? Which is awesome, right? So this is not particularly difficult, but it's just like, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, default arguments, don't care about that. We don't have them, which is very strange, very simple, I think. I'm not going to talk about this at all, at all, at all. Uh, because people hate me for that. Um, inlining, I really think it could be cool to have inlining. Uh, the inlining concept, at least, is um, so when your code is executing and you go to a function. So what happens? You save the current location in memory, you jump to that function, you execute the code, you pop the cost, whatever stack it's called, and then you get that address and you go back to that address and continue executing code. Right? So that's what happens. Um, but that whole thing, you know, popping, whatever, uh, uh, that costs too much CPU cycles. So inlining is the idea, okay, so if I know I'm going to do that too much, I'm going to force inline, for example, and I'm going to copy-paste that piece of code within my function, so no longer jumping back and forth. And the JVM has that, right? We, we have that. But it's, it's very limited what we have, and we cannot control it, right? It's like, I think, 12 byte instructions, right? Which is, which is nothing, a getter maybe, or something like that, right? And it has to be called like 10,000 times and all this uh, kind of stuff. In C++, you can just say that you want that, right? Uh, I'm not 100% sure it works 100% of the time, but it's there, and we don't have it. Maybe we'll get something similar with Grau and uh, that kind of stuff, but uh, I don't know, I don't know. So I like that. We don't have that. And excellent. I'm, uh, for once, I'm kind of on time, right? I'm very bad with time. And, uh, and absolutely bad. I did a talk once, and somebody and I asked the guy, so, so how much time do I have? And he was trying to be polite, said, no, 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 take as much time as you need. So I spent like two hours talking, and, uh, and people were hungry, right? It's like, uh, it wasn't like, uh, so it doesn't matter. Anyways, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to go through this. But this is like uh, some tips and tricks and weird stuff I came across. It's not really language-specific, per se. Um, right, so uh, the whole thing with pointers, right? Pointers are memory addresses. So if you have something in memory, then you can just look at that address till something changes, which is an awesome concept, right? Um, people in games, or at least in this game, or most of their source code at least, they tend to make everything public, right? They don't spend time in getters and setters and that kind of bullshit. Everything is just public and just, you know, do stuff with it. So. If you want to know who changed this x value, right? So this is a vector with an x. Who changed this x value? But it's accessed from 200 locations. What do you do, right? So you just watch your memory, right? In, in Java, it's, it's diffi more difficult, right? So this is from IntelliJ. Because I know how to do this in IntelliJ, I don't know how to do it. I know it's possible in Eclipse. Everything is possible in Eclipse, apparently. But I don't know how to do it. Uh, um, but you, this is how you do it. It's called, uh, uh, I don't know, a watch point, something like that. It's called something point, right? Uh, you can do this in IntelliJ. Uh, setting it up is way more difficult than what, what we're doing right there. Uh, but that's not the problem. The problem is this is slow. This is very slow. This is like the slowest way to debug that exists, that has existed. So, so let, let's put it this way, right? Um, I, use this, I try to use this a lot in the game. Not a single time have I used this, and have I reached the breakpoint, right? Not a single time. This is literally true, right? So I'm running the game 60 frames per second, and I do this, and it goes down to like one frame per second, or zero point whatever frame per second, and I never reach this. Never, right? But what's kind of good about this is, so I tried this a couple of times with enterprise applications, right? And it works, because you only have like a couple of thousand iterations, and it works. But games, you have millions and millions of iterations, and it doesn't work. But it's there. And I didn't know it was there, so it's awesome. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah. We kind of have time. Okay, so the gist of it is don't do this. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a very long discussion to, to, go, uh, to go into. Um, 
But basically, you know, putting floats and double anything with precision, with floaty board precision, is very difficult to get right. Right. So that's why, if if you work for a bank, or if you've ever worked for a bank, they just kind of worship the the concept of big decimal. They think if we use big decimal, we will never use mo lose money again in our existence or something, which isn't true either, actually. Uh, but it's just very difficult. Um, I, I, sorry, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna kind of. Go through that. Uh, popping the call stack, awesome concept. Um, when you set a breakpoint, you can just say, oh, no, no, I want to go to the previous uh, frame, drop this uh, frame and go to the fr previous one. Awesome, right? I know this is possible in Eclipse. It should be possible in every IDE, because it's not really IDE specific. It's something in the JVM tool thing itself. Um, but the reason I mentioned this um, is because in GDB, right, which is the Debugging version of GC, G, uh, G, yeah, the GNU, GNU debugging something. I don't remember. You have something called the reverse step. Yeah, I honestly don't remember what it stands for. I'm very bad with names. Um, and reverse step is actually the same way. The same way you step into something, you can just step back. You know, back step out of it, right? And it's, it's a very different concept than dropping a frame because a frame is really, uh, you know, you have like a scope which is inside that frame. If you change anything outside of the scope, it will never, you know, when you drop that frame, it will stay, right? This is a very different concept. You will reverse step, you keep reverse stepping, right? Uh, so this is awesome. So maybe one day we'll get something like this in Java. Uh, I hope so at least, right? Uh, like I said, I'm just mentioning that. Uh, this is actually there. Yeah, I had many, 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 many bugs uh, around this concept, uh, and it kind of relates to the one I skipped over. But this one is kind of more fun to explain, so I'm going to explain. Um, so these are the two operations, right? Mathematically speaking, both of these I can do this because I have two screens. Uh -huh. But mathematically, mathematically speaking, these are the same, right? It doesn't really matter, you know, whether you do it the multiplication or division first, right? It's the same operation, but you get different results. And the reason for this is, like you said, right, in anything that has floating point precision, uh, according to the IEEE standard 7, whatever, right, you have to round stuff up, right? So because you do an operation, you widen it a little bit, and then you kind of round it up, and then you do the following operation. So when you add the brackets, or when you remove the brackets, you do the operations in different order. So in the first one, you divide B by C first, and then the result gets multiplied by A. In the second one, you multiply A times B, and then the result gets divided by C. Granted, this is not, you know, a big difference, but for me at least, for games, for, you know, th things in 3D space, for NASA, for example, this, this matters a lot, right? Um, here is the exact same thing with addition and uh, subtraction. And this was an actual bug I had in the game. This exact bug, right? So I was expecting the result zero, but I was getting the minus whatever, which obviously isn't the same, even if it is a small, very small value, right? So, yeah, funny picture, right? Um, so here, uh, to add to your, uh, you know, whatever. So here is something with, with the same operator, even, right? It's, it's just about order. It's not really about the operator itself. It's just the order you do things in, right? Again, not the same value. Another one, right? Could do this all day. But I will not, because I shouldn't. Yes, conditional breakpoints. So uh, the previous talk was actually pretty co cool, right? So the, the one IntelliJ, he told me some cool stuff. But he didn't mention this, for example, that conditional breakpoints, you can do them. But they're fucking slow, right? And you will only notice this <laughs> if you go through millions and millions of iterations. Um, and of course, what would it? Oh yeah. So the conditional breakpoint, like like you showed in the previous presentation, if you weren't here, then yeah, I'm going to show you. It's basically you put the condition you want to evaluate. You know, break, only break on this breakpoint if it's you know according to this condition. The alternative is put a breakpoint and put an if statement, right? And put the breakpoint inside the if statement, which is what I do a lot actually. It sounds stupid, I know, but let me show you a benchmark. Like we mentioned before, benchmarks are true, right? They're they're awesome. So ignore the first line and. Uh, I've been ignoring this first line for like a year, but I'm too lazy to make a new picture, so ignore the first line, right? Uh, but, but basically this, right? So this is the if statement and a normal breakpoint. And I don't remember what I did because I don't know anything about Excel, so I probably Googled some stuff to like divide this by this or do something, whatever. But it's approximately like 180 times slower, right? To do it with the normal breakpoints is 180 times faster than to do it with the conditional breakpoint. 
And the reason is, I think the reason is simple at least, right? It's basically because when you do a conditional breakpoint, you go back to interpretive mode, right? You're not running compiled code anymore. You're kind of like running a script. That's kind of what it is. Uh, I think, at least, right? If you see the IntelliJ guy around, whose name I forgot, because like I said, I'm terrible with names, right? I mean, he was on like half an hour ago. Ask him, he probably knows better, uh, if you're interested. But you're probably not interested, you're just waiting for the beer or something, right? So, uh, so yeah, so uh, very, very slow. Um, yes, I finally have time to tell this story. Um, yeah, so this was like the first time I had like a working version of the game. I think it was like seven, no? Uh, nine, ten months in the game. And this is the introduction video, which I will show you in a minute. And I was getting the one on the left side, but I should have been getting the one on the right side, right? So and as you can see, it's kind of blue, right? And granted, I chose the wrong screenshot to, to view, but it was really annoying to get the same screenshot twice, right? So I just left it up there. And I was getting a blue, which is very strange, right? At first, I didn't notice, because if you're working on something for nine months and it finally works, you don't care. Right, um, but it was kind of blue. And uh, this this particular part, this is an MPEG video, right? An MPEG video is basically a lot of pictures. It's just a lot of pictures in sequence in a large data stream. So what I did for this, I loaded the whole thing in a byte buffer. And every time I would just get a frame, do some decoding, convert it from uh, YAV to RGBA, I think, right? And just view it on the screen. That's the only thing I was doing. And I spent like a long time debugging this, right? Uh, and it turns out uh, uh, this is actually a bug in Java itself, right? Uh, I was using a byte buffer, and a byte buffer has a couple of methods. One is called duplicate, one is called slice, one is called something else, which I forgot. A duplicate is like a clone, a slice is a clone from that specific location, and the third one I don't remember, because those three have this bug. Um, when you do one of those three op operations, you copy it, or you clone it, or you slice it, without, with everything, with the position, with everything, except the endianness of your byte buffer, right? So this thing was, I think, little endian, and every time I was duplicating it, I was getting big endian, right? So instead of RGBA, I was getting BARG, right? So that's why it's so blue, right? And then I went online, and I asked people, and it's a bug in Java, we know about it, fuck you, we're not going to fix it, because it's backwards compatibility, which we worship in Java, of course, right? So, so that's that bug, uh, which is one of my more fun ones. Uh, and I have enough time to tell you about this one. <sighs> um, yeah. So this is debug mode of the game, so it shouldn't look like this, obviously. But then the one on the right side is the C++ version of the game, the one on the left is my version. The big red orb, right, that's, that's just the, the Mars planet should be emitting some ambient light, right? which is shown here as the big purple thing, which is completely different, as you might have noticed. And uh, that uh, logo is the static block, right? This was something that was working in my code at, at some point, right? Because every time I made the release of the game uh, for myself, you know, right? I made a video to prove to myself it was working, right? You weren't dreaming. It was actually working, right? Um, so I know this was working, uh, but, you know, it, it broke sometime, and I thought, okay, I have it in my Git history. I will fix it. So, you know, I don't care about it right now. And every like couple of months, I would look at it for like a day, and okay, I'm gonna fix it. Nah, I'm gonna look at it later. And then I don't know what happened, and I said to myself, no, 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 I'm gonna fix this. I'm just gonna fix this. And I went very low level debugging this. Uh, you know, I went tracing the, the OpenGL calls to the video card, and I couldn't really find what's what's going wrong. Uh, it turns out, this is a very long story, and I don't have enough time for that, but uh, it turns out um, this is actually a bug in the uh, NVIDIA driver, uh, which is interesting, right? Because at some point, I tried it at my, on my other computer, which one of my other computers, which has an AMD card. It was working, which is, it was impossible, right? And at some point, they updated that driver, which wasn't compatible anymore with the version of the wrapper, OpenGL wrapper I was using which was producing this, right? So I, I've since fixed it, and I posted on their forum, but they've ignored me. So uh, <laughs> life is uh, interesting, right? And uh, I think that's the last. Yeah, I have this one, but I'm going to, yeah, I love NVIDIA. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to show a demo. And the demo takes some time to load, if I can find my pointer. So you can ask questions. If you're too shy, you can still ask questions. And, uh, any questions? I can't see very well. Should just shout. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I have tried Kotlin, but not, but not for this, no. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, sorry? For the next four years, you mean, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. I get that question a lot, actually, Kotlin or Scala or stuff like that. Um, but like I said, I don't remember exactly the reason why I started this. So doing it in Kotlin might not... This is really true, by the way. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not kidding, so uh, I don't remember. So see the way it's uh, working. Oh yeah, and uh, by the way, so so the whole thing, the block of static you were seeing, that was that's actually I'm not sure if you can see it, but the logo should be shimmering up and down a little bit. That's actually the block of static. It wasn't like uh, what's it called, blending correctly, right? So uh, yeah, it's just uh, okay. I lost sound. I lost sound. Any other questions? Oh, sound is right. Any questions? Anybody brave enough? Yes, sir. Sorry? Wait, wait for the mic. Choose a higher difficulty. Yeah, OK. That's, uh, I don't know. I'm always used to choosing this one, because it doesn't matter. It's, it will crash anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah? Hey, at the start, uh, you can't even compile the code because yeah. uh, everything is related to everything else. So how does it? How do you bootstrap it? Even not running, just compiling the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the Union Aerospace Corporation is the largest corporate Sorry. entity. I honestly in don't have a good answer for that. Um, the way I did it, at least, because I used to do uh, emulators a lot, like console emulators and Nintendo, that kind of stuff. And I was kind of used to that way of working, because until you have like most of the game done, you know, most of, most of the emulator done, you won't get any results on the screen. So I am kind of used to it, uh, but I honestly don't have an answer for that, sorry. Uh, I can invent an answer if you want, right? But uh, no, sorry, I honestly don't have an answer. Can people actually see this? Because it's, it's going to become a little dark. Any other questions? Uh, I know this is the cool part, so yeah. Mars approach, Dark Star with U07063, passing through 38,000. <coughs> Roger, Dark Star, descend to 2000, set speed, contact ground on 26972. Roger that tower. We have them. Landing in a few moments. Excellent. See that Counselor Swan is sent directly to me. Yes, sir. Tower, Dark Star on fire. Yeah, the game is really this, this dark, so yeah. Choice. True, but this is the last time. Ooh. I'm tired of running damage control every time he makes a mess. No. Right, you're the control, and if that fails, I'm the damage. If that's what it takes, no. the Truger is gonna. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, it's way too dark, so let's do this. Cheetah always good. Right? Yeah, it's just... Uh, but it should... Yeah, the lights are a little broken still. Not sure why everybody's coming in right now. Is there something happening here right now? Yes, but, uh, now, I'm going to show you something else, because I still have 1 minute and 38 seconds. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Too much. Yeah, I haven't done, I have done zero optimization at the moment. I only do optimize the stuff that uh, doesn't allow me to program. Uh, so I don't care about runtime, CPU usage, memory usage at the moment, because I have too many bugs. I will make it break right now, just watch. Right? And this part, this slow part, which is very Three. funny, it's still in the original game as you well. Reached Bravo so team. I'm actually that good or that bad that I replicated the slowness Reaching of the, the original as well. So, which I'm proud of. Oh. Bye. 
Did I do them? No. Okay. Should be a zombie here. So the physics is broken. Where is the guy? I honestly don't remember where he is. Okay. I don't see anything. I can do this. Oh, no. Two trees and then do one, for example. Yeah, much easier. Yeah, I used to work like this for like forever. Hey. See, that is <coughs> what you see right there. <coughs> bye, bye. Thank you very much.